You are listening to the INCJ podcast, conversations about international criminal justice. Now we talk about rehabilitation. It, it's it's a, a word that oftentimes when you talk about rehabilitation is a word that oftentimes people uh, see from different perspectives. But when you look at what it really means to talk about rehabilitation for persons who have been incarcerated and what is the reason, the rationale for that rehabilitation and how does that really link up to the whole notion of reintegration? And what is it in it for the you know for the community for the society as a whole? So I will start, but first of all, I will start and explain primarily first from a uh, the perspective of Nigeria as a country, and then I'm also going to say a few words in terms of some of the challenges for some countries in Africa and indeed countries that are dealing with very limited resources in terms of looking at this notion of rehabilitation. As a beginning point, I would kind of want us to reflect and ask ourselves, who are the people we find in places of custody? Who are the people who are in prisons across the globe, Nigeria, in different African countries, different parts of the world? I have seen that there are mainly three types of people. Just follow me and I will explain what I mean by this. So the very first group is the people that I say, called the innocent. And you may say, why am I talking about this? Yeah, We have a situation where there are people who you find in custody who have absolutely committed no offense. They have been the right persons at the wrong places. So either they have been picked up during raiding or they have been wrongly accused or they are petty offenders and petty offenders like people who are hawking and all that. And if they are not able to pay fines before you know it, they are processed and they are in places of detention. And that is a challenge in itself. So when you talk about the notion of rehabilitation for somebody who had been issued, started up by not being, uh, as it were, a criminal, yeah? And maybe doing what they felt was legitimate enough for them to do. But the problem here is that one day, one day in place of custody, whether he's at the police station, whether he's in, play, in, in custody, as a waiting trial before the person is convicted, is an adequate to get the person uh, more in, indoctrinated by criminal gangs, by people who are uh, hiding criminals. And don't forget the other angle, that anger can also come in because you are seeing yourself being in this place and you don't think you deserve to be in this place. So you find that, that beyond just looking at the issues about rehabilitation, as it works on this, you need to un ask yourself, what is the chances that this person, when he comes back, will want to be fully integrated into the community. So how do I deal with issues about uh, the person's, you know, wrong treatment and how the person would be feeling and what are the conditions that have tended to make that person to be in that position in the first instance. The second are the people I um, will call the petty offenders, minor offenders. They committed offenses, but these offenses are not really such that deserve to be treated with a custodial sentence. So you require non-custodian sentences, you know, and community sanctions, be them community service and the rest of it. Good thing the Nigerian Correctional Service Act of 2019 have now provided the platform to enable um, implementation of non-custodian measures. So it then means that the more the court begins to grant these um, as sanctions, the more those persons who are minor and petty offenders uh, will be treated in that way. Then the third is actually the ones who have had in the criminals, they have committed offenses and all the rest of that. And the question therefore is that for those persons, unless they die in custody, they are going to come out someday. So for all of these three categories, there is a real need for us to begin to look at what we do with these people while they are in custody. You know, and um, when I started several years ago and I did a little research to find out the what I call the social demographic characteristics of those persons who were detained in the police stations and those people who were who were in uh, prison custody. Okay, I have realized that it doesn't matter whether the person said yes they were innocent or they were guilty. Each of these persons requires some interventions. 
So take this scenario. You find somebody who works in a, I mean, who did nothing, who was in the perhaps fall within the category I gave earlier, which is about being innocent. You look around, you find that there were people who are poor. Uh, with little or no education, because oftentimes if it was just a very rich person and not the rest of them, the likelihood of them being in that position will not be there. They will have enough money to hire the kind of lawyers that will get them out of that kind of mess. Yeah. But also I found that, that even for those ones who had committed those offenses or who have accepted or said, yes, they committed those offenses, you also looked at these, their social demographic characteristics. They also had challenges. You know, sexually abused for some of them, little or no education, no training, uh, poor job skills, some of them no jobs, you know, some of them from broken homes, some of them with drug uh, challenges and all the drug dependencies and substance abuse and all the rest of that. So for each of these groups, it's very clear that there is something the society needs to do for them. You need to be able to identify what are those risk factors that you can then walk through what are those risk factors? What are the things that if we don't sort out, this person's going back into the community, they are going to reoffend. And the statistics on the offending behavior makes a very big case for this. We have the statistics of something that is showing about 60% and above. Now, look at the context for Nigeria. Nigeria has a disproportionate number of persons who are in custody as those persons who have not been those persons who have not been found guilty. And these are persons who they have not been found guilty and therefore there's no sanction given yet. And what this means is that you cannot say they are going to spend five years, three years, two years. So it becomes difficult to plan a regime, plan the program that you require this person to go through. We are talking about over 70% in some instances you look at the general population for the whole country. In some of the custodial centers, uh, centers this is about 90% of those who are in those custody are persons who have not been convicted. Now, if you say that, it may look like it's a small problem, but when you recognize the fact that many of them spend long time in custody, 10 years, five years, more, in that condition, that becomes very problematic. Okay, some of them stay beyond the time they would have stayed if they were even convicted for that offense. So the challenge of dealing with a high number of persons who are not being convicted is a big challenge because all you are doing is processing these people thinking about going to court. The, the transactional level of doing that alone is very burdensome. It becomes problematic for proper rehabilitation to take place. Because you're talking about a rehabilitation that, that has no time frame for you to work on. Because if I know I have one year with an inmate, I can say the first three months, perhaps you go through this program. The next three months you do this. The next three months, then it becomes a problem. Now, there's also something we observe. In, in interestingly, some custodial centers begin to feel that, listen, for somebody who is what you call a waiting trial, a person who has not been convicted, yeah, though some of those are waiting trial cases have actually started. And for some of them, that the whole notion of saying to them, you need to take participate in a vocational training or participate in uh, any form of training may be a chance. So it's only if they desire to do it. Now, if somebody is angry with the system, oftentimes they won't even want to think about this. Okay, but there are some programs, and I want to use this opportunity to talk about some of those programs currently happening in some of the custodial centers in Nigeria. So you have the open university system. The open university um, has a collaboration with the Nigerian Correctional Service, whereby inmates are allowed to register to attend university program like distance learning. And there've been a lot of good stories coming out of that. Yeah? But then that's, those are the ones obviously that are in the stage to be able to do, go to do that program. But there are a lot of them who are also asking for um, fees for the fees to be paid because that's not automatic. The government doesn't pay that to cover up. It says even those who want to do examination, external examination to be able to be uh, get the necessary uh, payment uh, papers in terms of the criteria requirement for that registration. 
But also remember that you talk about also vocational training, whereby some of the people who may not want to go through the trajectory of the you know, formal education may want to get involved in. And where do, what do we find here? We find a situation whereby many of the equipment uh, in, you know, that are supposed to help them becomes um, not really having the proper equipment that they can utilize for all of them. They, you know, and how productive those workshops are becomes a challenge. Now, an interesting thing happened with the new Correctional Service Act of 2019. There is one of the provisions that now says that income that is generated from vocational workshops in, in, in custodial centers and from the prison farm centers can actually be divided into three. Before that law was made, what was happening was that every funds that were generated or were realized from these workshops were retired straight to the uh, government at the national level. But with the new law, it now says it can be shared into three. One to be divided, shared among the inmates, the other one to be put back into that business, into that vocational workshop to kind of, kind of uh, it's like a business plan to make sure that it stretches that particular business endeavor or enterprise. Whereas the third will now be returned back um, into uh, to the coffers, coffers of uh, the funds for the government. But what this means is that we need to ensure that activities are, are being carried out and that these workshops are functioning to, in the level that they have it, adequate equipment, uh, adequate requirement for supplies and production, and that these issues of money is being realized are also being um, implemented in the way that this Nigeria Correctional Service Act of 2019 envisaged it. But that's something that is also quite a challenge. So uh, you have see a lot of workshops that are not functioning optimally. You see a lot of workshops that do not receive uh, requests for the production of the things that they produce, which should make, you know, like which will make sure that this income that they realize will be high enough. So that is one challenge. Now, I've spoken to you about what we see in terms of some of the workshops that are existing, yeah? But the other aspect that we need to also bear in mind is the fact that the nature of the workshops, the nature of the skills. So remember what I told you about the statistics in terms of the number of persons who have not been convicted. Just think about it a while. Now, if you are concerned about your court case and you're still dealing with court case and you are not settled in to start thinking of how to plan your program and your time in custody, yeah? What then this actually begins to bring in mind is that when they ask you to do a training workshop, and sometimes those skills training are things that are long term. So if you are going to learn welding, for example, or how to sew clothes, or what they call sewing or tailoring or whatever, some of those things being it here that it will take them like three years or four years or five years to learn. The inmates completely do not want to be interested in it. So what we have found that is that you know, uh, skills that are easier, that have a short learning span or duration, you know, like bead making and all that, tend to be more popular. So in a facility like the Ikoi Custodial Center in Lagos, we realize that there's a large number of those kinds of small um, skills that makes the image um, that are short term. And you find that for those skills that are short term, the image tend to want to sign it up or up to it. But if those part types of skills are not bringing in that inmates can see tangibly what they can hold on, it becomes also very problematic. So again, we are talking about the rehabilitation activities that need to happen in. Now, I think that part of where we are getting it wrong, and which is what I believe that we need to begin to think about as a people to be able to ensure that this is dealt with. Right from the day one, the first minute somebody gets into a place of custody, into a prison, as it were, Nigerian Correctional Service Act describes it now for Nigeria as custodial centers, you know, uh, or correctional centers. So that's why I'm using those terms. But it means the same thing as the prison, but in that, as described in many jurisdictions. You need to do a risk and needs assessment. The fact that oftentimes, even this is not done on time, and once you've been able to do it, that now think of risk and needs assessment that tells you the challenges that this person has. Now, because of the overcrowding 
of many of these facilities, they are not able to keep, for example, the issue of segregation. So let's say, for example, you find out that this person is a minor offender, a first offender, or perhaps and things like that. Because space is a challenge. They cannot put the person in the same facility or the same cell with somebody who is hardened, which is wrong. So because of the population of the overcrowded nature, the clear thing you can really say for sure you have distinction or categorization in uh, inside the facility for AIDS between the males and the females for the facilities that are um, both male and female. And by the way, Section 34 of the Nigerian Correctional Service Act of 2019 have also said that we need to have separate facilities for women in all the states of the Federation plus the Federal Capital Territory in Nigeria. So that becomes a challenge. Yeah. So that population is, is something that, be, that one needs to begin to think of how then this affects. And it's not just Nigeria. I saw this also in many countries, especially countries coming out of conflict. I saw that in Burundi, the same thing in Democratic Republic of Congo, and even in some aspects of some of the um, uh, facilities in some of this country, the Central African Republic, for example, the same. So it, it's important to look at the relationship between overcrowding and the issue of proper categorization and classification of, of inmates within that facility to ensure that your risks and needs its uh, assessment is done properly so that you now know which cell you need to keep this person, what kind of programs this person requires and how do you deal with it? Now, having spoken about this, there is one other thing I want to bring to the table as we're discussing. It's really this whole notion about who are the other significant parts that will help rehabilitation work well within a facility. So you have a lot of time, you have civil society organizations, faith-based organizations come up, and many of them are providing activities that with, that are also helpful. So the key thing here is that when you see many of these activities, both the ones that have been introduced by the non-governmental organizations and faith-based organizations, and the ones that are introduced by government, or the ones that are introduced with the support of private sector, we need to think of how do we have a holistic assessment of this so that it's clear what trajectory, which and how does these trainings align with the needs and risk of the inmates? So someone who has anger management or had a problem in terms of the offense relating to violence offense should have training such as anger management trainings, training such as alternative to violence trainings and the rest of that. But there is also one element that I was trying to say that oftentimes people don't even talk about. And that's about the role of the family. You know, I have always said this, in an educational system, for example, you need the teachers, you need the parents, you need the family to make education work right. So it's a partnership thing. The teachers alone cannot enforce it and do it to the level that they desire. So why is it therefore that when we are talking about inmates, oftentimes, including those people who we have had challenges uh, coping with as uh, law abandoned citizens in the community, because there have been people who have broken the law some a great number of them. So why is it therefore that many instances we have excluded this powerful role that the family is supposed to play? You may ask me, how is this going to apply? And I give you an example. So one day we had, uh, I, I raised this issue in one of the custodial facilities. This was the maximum security um, facility in Kri Lagos. And I said this, so look at what is it that we need to do for the inmate when the inmate comes in. We want to make sure that this inmate enrolls or signs up to any constructive programs or regime happening within the facility, yeah? So you want to ask the inmate, please, you need to sign up for vocational workshops. You need to sign up uh, for for my education if that's the where you have, but, or whatever it is. Now, how can we make that inmate see this as part of a process that is good for them? How can we see the inmates taking this as achievement. Remember, some of these people have people who may not have achieved any tangible thing or may not have been celebrated for any tangible thing. So can you imagine where you have an open program or you have a family visit and you have one particular, maybe once every month, once every quarter, when you now say to the family, come and see the workshops where you're, your the, the member of your family who we are with is, is, is working. And you're able to have opportunity to let them know the progression. 
Oh, he has done an anger management course. Oh, we have moved him now. He's now working in the workshop. We have seen that he have learned the skill. He is now, you know, the kind of person he's now producing his own shoes and things like that. Something that will make the family to be able to say to the inmates, this is good. And that can help reinforce that behavior. Okay, so I think that we need to look at it because it is important. Sometimes we completely forget that that issue about what we do with the inmates while they're in custody and then think of what needs to happen in the community. We have to bring the family as part of that partnership. Oftentimes, nobody is caring about the family. Oftentimes, even visits are not encouraged. And when they have them, it's not very constructive, meaning that that visit should be also an opportunity that you hear from the family member. You try to promote bonding. You try to use the family member to reinforce the relationship and reinforce the compliance of the inmates while they are in custody. Now, I don't want to forget the link in the community. I keep saying this. Rehabilitation means nothing if it is not fully related to the whole notion of reintegration. Okay? So this person gets into the community so how has what we have done or provided, how are we making sure that there is a link to that in the community? And this is where I see a big gap. So we have the Nigerian Correctional Service Act, which I have said clearly, have uh, provided now the whole notion of community service. And let me just quickly re remind us that section two, subsection 18D of the Nigerian Correctional Service Act of 2019 tells us four major things that is considered to be the objective of that new law. The first time it says that this new law is supposed to help to ensure the compliance with international human rights standards and good correctional practices, yeah? The second, it says that the new law is supposed to promote enabling platform for the effective implementation of non-custodial measures. The third, it says is to promote the whole notion of corrections, rehabilitation, reinformation, and reintegration. And the fourth, which is the, D part, which is section two, subsection one, sub D. It talks about having an institutionalized sustainable mechanism for controlling the population of persons who are awaiting trial. Okay, that persons who have not been yet convicted. Now, the question here now, how does this issue of rehabilitation relate to each and every one of the states? And I see that very clearly. Section 10, also of the law, says clearly many things around issue of rehabilitation issue of identification of antisocial behaviors and all the rest of that. Now, we need to translate this into critical action, need to reality. How do we do that? In the community, what is this level of stigma? And many persons come out, you have been an ex-prisoner, ex-offender, ex-inmate, you come out, the community not there to accept you fully. So how many of those are able to have, accommodation is a big problem. Yeah, how you make sure that that which you have trained them in the inside custody, they're able to implement it out there and in the community. And this is why for Prawa, we have um, acquired a, a, a land for what we call the Youth Entrepreneurship Empowerment and Rehabilitation Village. This idea is to see how you can have facility, one, that can divert some persons from custody to this facility, which is like, um, that can enable people, what are serving as a halfway home, but also for those who you need to build their skills and capacity. So in such a way, provide a holistic intervention for them, both on the psychological, spiritual, economic level, so that the risk of them offending will be minimized. And even for those who have come out, so that they have a place, because part of what we do in terms of rejecting these people, we throw them back into that subculture of, people who are more criminally minded. And that's not helpful. So I want to state very clearly that rehabilitation is not just something we do or ought to do for the benefit of the inmates or the benefit of the ex-inmate, but it is something that we need to do for the in, in the interest of the society at large. So any person who is interested in community safety any person who is interested in reducing offending behavior, any person who wants to ensure that the, if the people out there are safer must be interested in how you ensure that those who have passed through the criminal justice system, that they don't offend or re-offend. And I'm using this very clearly in terms of re-offending and offending, because for somebody who didn't do anything in the first instance, 
before they were arrested, then for such a person, he, he wouldn't say that his person is going to reoffend. It's just now offended. But as we know, many of the time, they come in contact with those people who will teach them how to offend, even if they, don't de they didn't do it in the first instance. And that's why what we do right from the one, someone comes in contact with the criminal justice system is very important. The youth, the young people, young offenders, we need to effectively engage a, them in a process that reduces their risk of offending and that addresses their needs so that it will be turning them more into law abiding uh, citizens. And again, this is an area that Prawa is looking for partners because we know that this is something that can work. And it's a challenge primarily, primarily for countries that are, are in very, lim have very limited resources. So you have willing personnel. We have people who want to make a difference. We want people who can support these people. But again, the challenge of not making this work becomes a problem. So I think we need to support those who are in course of the correctional officers who are doing the best to make this work, both in the custodial settings and in the non-custodial settings. We also need to encourage such programs, as I have mentioned, in terms of having an integrated facility in the community to address this, you know, and once we do that, we would go far. But we need to have clear guidelines and making sure that these guidelines are implemented. So I will try to use my last four minutes to say something about this, what I call the whole of society approach. I think that rehabilitation requires a whole of society approach. So what does the whole of society approach means is that everyone will see their role, their part, not just the correctional officers, but also all the other players within the justice system, but also the family, but also even the other agents of the government. And what do I mean by this? The Ministry of Education needs to play a role. The Ministry of Commerce and Industry, Ministry of Agriculture, Ministry of Youth, so needs to also play a role. Then you look at the different tiers of government, including at the federal, local level, that they need to also play a role. So that we, as we move through this trajectory, then the private sector. So you have the public, the volunteer, volunteer and the private sector, all trying to look at ways of making this work. You ask me how a private sector can? They can set up vocational workshops, set up industries in these facilities, but whether it's in the community, as the case we're talking about, the one we want to, the youth uh, village we're talking about, or in custodial settings and ensure that people do not only be trained, but that these people who are trained are engaged to do the work, do the need for. So again, there's a whole lot of opportunities, but those opportunities need to be activated. You need to pick everyone, every individual who has been in custody, who has come through the process or who have offended, and then say, we can help you turn the next leaf. We can open the second door for you. So it's not about locking the second prison, that you have gone into custody, you have gone into prison. That is not the end of the day. That is not the end of the road. That is a second chance. And that second chance is a chance that all of us, the whole of society will make happen to let you know that you can turn another leaf, to make you know that you can be supported to live a law abiding life outside custody and outside that process, and then ensure that all the mechanisms are made to do this. So I, I want to um, tell you that it's possible. Uh, Prawa is interested in making this happen. I know there's a lot of people who are doing this. And I thank you also for this opportunity to speak on this particular subject matter that is very important. And I hope to hear some questions, some comments, and I will be very willing um, to, to, to respond to it. And some of my colleagues are also here and they can also speak on this. But this is indeed a very important topic, as I will say to you. That's a topic that makes our community safer. Is the topic of, unfortunately, many people don't want to talk about, but we need it. We need rehabilitation. We need to think rehabilitation. We need to think about how to put a stop to offending behavior. And we need to do it together. All of us, the government, the voluntary sector, the private sector, the whole of society, 
not forgetting the family and the community. Thank you again for the opportunity. Thank you. Dr. Uji, that was really great. Um, and I'm, I'm so privileged to be able to, 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 to listen to you and see how uh, passionate you are about this topic. That really came, came through. And I think it fits really well with some of the other conversations that we've had together about this holistic approach and this rehabilitative approach. And uh, I'd, I've certainly noted some questions down that I'd like to ask you, but what I'd like to do first of all, I know Professor Amali is with us. Uh, mm. And if you, if you unmute and turn on your camera, maybe we can, and if you've got any other colleagues, Dr. Uji, that you want to invite Yeah, in. there are. I see Ogechi, I see Katrin, I see Katumi, I see a lot of my colleagues. Yeah, we, we've got here. about 15 minutes, I think, which we can have okay. a, 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 a bit of a Q and A in a chat. And, um, okay. uh, and so, Dr. Amali, what 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 is your um, uh, view on on this, and do you think that passion will be translated into policy? Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm always very pleased to see Dr. Ju talk about rehabilitation and reformation in Nigeria. She's so that's what she has been doing for years and a very good advocate of uh, prison reform in this in Nigeria. Um, I'm happy that with her passion so far, um, she has drawn attention of government that has led to the Nigerian Criminal Service Act of 2019, which is uh, talking about. But one, one thing with Nigeria is that we don't lack policy, but implementation most often has been the challenge down here. And so this is a great opportunity for us to, to showcase what policy we have, but looking for partners or international collaborators to be able to implement the good policies that we have in the Nigerian Correctional Service Act of 2019. Thank you very much. Dr. Uche, the, in terms of, you described the situation of overcrowding as being quite, uh, um, it needs to be dealt with. And it's almost as if a system of triage, you know, you have to prioritize who you are dealing with. What, do people who, run and manage the correctional services in Nigeria understand that process, do you think? And what is, what is mm -hmm. the level of education, input and training that you need to bring yeah. forward to help with that? Yeah, I, I thank you very much. And you see, as Professor Malay has said, you know, the one of the best things that happened to us as a people and here in Nigeria is the enactment of that Nigerian Correctional Service Act of 2019. As a matter of fact, some of the other African countries, some are already indicating interest in terms of looking at how they can adapt that. Now, why do I say that? Almost everything that is an issue was there was an attempt to address it. So Section 12, for example, of the Nigerian Correctional Service Act provides a check and balance process. It provides an opportunity to activate an early warning signal. So what does it say? It says, when the because every custodial facility had designated capacity, official capacity, you know, of the uh, capacity of that facility. So he's saying whenever this facility is about to be filled or filled, that the superintendent in charge of the custodial center or the state controller of corrections should activate an early warning signal, send a message to the chief judge, the attorney general, the you know justice reform team, and all the prerogative of mercy and all the rest of and his people. He's sending this information to the people who have the power to reduce that population. And those people have three months. He says within three months, these people must do something to reduce this population. And if they don't within three months do it, you as the custodian superintendent or the controller should refuse to accept anymore. There have never been a law doing this before. They have not started implementing it, but what this is intended to do is to make sure that you use the custodial facility for those who require it. So you can ask me, where will you put these other people? Non-custodian. Part two of that act tells them different things, community corrections and the rest of that, restorative justice and the rest that can be utilized. So we need, the correctional officers are aware of what needs to be done. They are being taught, but also the other criminal justice system officers, the other players are, need to also you know, actualize things that would help make this possible. 
And is there anything specific within the community of African nations that uh, Nigeria is part of, you know, immediately part of that is that you think is specific and that offers um, opportunities for collaboration, you know, co-development where you can maybe if if resources are limited in Nigeria, that maybe you can form shared networks uh, within your with your neighbours and your I mean, give, given the context of, as you described so well, you know, kind of coming out of conflict. Uh, you know, that's yeah, maybe well, more difficult to do. Well, two, two things that I, I think can be done. You know, remember I kept mentioning about this, um, uh, what I call the youth village, youth rehabilitation and empowerment village. That's supposed to be a demonstration program to show that this is possible. So it's supposed to be made to be self-sustaining. So you must show what can be done that can stand on its own so that you can think of replicating this at different locations, including different African countries, yeah? The other thing is this whole notion, you know, I said it before, but let me repeat again, the issue of the whole of system approach, all of society approach. So even if you take off the components about the government, so how can you then build synergy? In Africa, community is very powerful. Family is powerful. So what we need to do is to bring back the notion of community involvement in the dispensation of justice, which was the what used to happen before the colonial system came in and we lost it. If you remember, that was what helped Rwanda in terms of gachacha. So we need a model which recognizes this is, you know, the benefit of the community, which recognizes the power that you see in the family. So this now, then but you don't lose the importance of the other circles, the importance of the, of the private sector, the importance of the other government agencies, not just the agencies that are criminal justice. So even social development and even the health sector, all of the government, all of the society, all of the private sector, you may say, but how is this going to work? Even the private sector, you can take, you can take the elements that you are that is within your sphere of influence and control. Corporate social responsibility, I know it's doable, but we need to get people to know that that is it. You know, we've, we've, there, there were some advocacy that we did in the past, and we saw state government, governors, going into custodial centers to have bad days, you know, and do certain things. Why? why that is important. It is important to look at this as a, you know, as a, a comprehensive package, not an ad hoc, not just go to do your bad day to this year and the next year you forget it. No, we need to think of this as a whole, as a whole of system. And I think it's possible. Yes, that element of community is a very powerful thing in, in Africa, community, family. So let's rework it back into the whole notion of the justice administration. That way it becomes. And by the way, there's a lot of things happening in the informal justice system that is not captured. So much happening. And that was why even in the Nigerian Correctional Service Act, there is a clear section around the restorative justice that even tells you that this can also happen even after custody. So all through different stages, because we believe that the family and the community, the community is very powerful. And let's let's do more in terms of utilizing that. Like this. I, I, you've used two phrases, which I think are, are really representative systems and social as in families faith groups you know civil society groups as almost being separate held separately and that i think is one of the things that's come through in many of our conversations that we've had today that there's a kind of tension between the systems approach which looks at efficiency and you know and measures things and then the um the social approach which looks at um that's what I'm looking for. It looks at um, enrichment and, re as you say, re redemption, that you, you spoke very passionately about the idea that people can have a second chance and they that we can. can we can redeem ourselves. I want to ask Dr. Uh, Professor O'Malley about this in terms of internationally, what, does not, what do you think from this experience of uh, correction services in Nigeria that others can learn uh, that Nigeria has to offer? Um, rather than uh you know so so we're, we're talking to people around the world today uh so what would you say is the you've got the policy what's the practice that people can learn from uh that that happens in nigeria and and, and please uh, after dr uh, professor mali says i speaks i think if my colleague Ogechi is here i would also want her to share her experiences in terms of what and what is happening and any of my colleagues in terms of what we have seen in terms of non-custodial to you
So what? So I'll repeat. I'll repeat the question, uh, Professor Marley. In terms of, in te you said you said you've got the practice. You've got the policy. What's yes. the practice that people can learn from, uh, from the experience in Nigeria? What would be an example of that? All right. Thank you very much. Like um, you rightly said, there is this tension between society and the and the conventional criminal justice approach to crime. Uh, uh, to, to the justice system. And I think why that is happening is it, uh, it, because of what I call defensive solidarity. Because before the coming of the English jurisprudence in Africa, African indigenous system had a way of dealing with offenders that are community oriented and focus on transforming the behavior of that offender. But as, as, as the as community and, the, and the Africa begin to organize, that form of community and indigenous oriented justice and the, 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 the English, they receive English law that dwell uh, mainly on litigation and prosecution of offender now took over. Today, because of the overcrowding of prisons and the delay in the dispensation of justice within the criminal justice system in Africa, so many Africans are beginning to rethink of revisiting how can the indigenous way of, this, uh, of crime prevention, uh, or the indigenous way of dealing with crime and conflict resolution be remodernized in the form of restorative justice principles, community mediation principles, alternative dispute resolution principles, which is gaining ground all over Africa these days. And I'm happy to inform you that, like I said, the Nigerian Correctional Service Act of 2019 already mainstreamed this principle in the act, which needs to be extended and implemented. Thank you. Who is your colleague that you wanted to bring in, Dr. Uju? Let's okay, I mean, there are a lot of my colleagues. Um, so if, okay, so let me just do it. So we have Ogechi. So, um, you know, we do quite, so Ogechi is there. So I have Ogechi Ogu. Ogechi can say a few words. I don't know how much time we have. We have also gifts. How much time do you have so that we, you can we, share we've, the- we've, we've got about until about five, five or six minutes, I think is Okay, good. so yeah. if you want, some of my colleagues can give you different perspective as to, things that we are doing that involve in the community. So Ogechi okay, can talk a little bit about the non custom experiences that we are doing with the non-custodial measures, uh, implementation across the um, across the con uh, country. Then Katumi, my colleague Katumi from Kanu office, will talk about the what we are doing with the youth, you know, the youth at risk in terms of the amateurs. And then I saw also Gift, who may tell you a little bit about the community uh, dialogue we are doing with security and community dialogue. Just a little bit to show you some of the things that can happen. Uh, and I also see Joma there. It depends on how much time we have. Ogechi, can you just um, can you okay. just speak uh, for one two minutes, please, so that others can. Okay, yeah, thank you, thank you for the opportunity given to us today, given to Prawa, to Dr. Agomo to talk about rehabilitation in Nigeria. So I will just, in a few minutes, focus on non-custodial measures. And that is all about the alternative uh, sentencing. And this is to say that this originated, you know, is giving a background in the new law that has already been mentioned, the Nigerian Correctional Service uh, Act. And the introduction of non-custodial measures has brought in an entirely new perspective to dealing with crime and uh, sanctions. And this has been embraced, embraced, um, you know, by the Nigerian Correctional Service uh, um, personnel and Nigerians generally, because a lot has been done around that utilizing technology. Incidentally, at the inception of uh, the at the point accent was given to this law, COVID nineteen came in, and Prawa engaged technology to 
build capacity of non-custodial officers. And this is doing, you know, getting on greatly within the states of the Federation because these officers have taken up on this. And during COVID, uh, peak of COVID-19, about 23,000, you know, offenders, we are supervised in the community. So this is a new perspective in terms of dealing with crime and is being embraced by the people. A lot is happening in terms of capacity building across you know, the offices of the Nigerian Correctional Service and uh, restorative justice, as has been mentioned by Professor Omele, is being you know, uh, you know, tried to be instituted, especially at pre-trial stage, to deal with issues of um, pre-trial detention and reduce congestion in custodial centers. Okay. A lot is actually okay. happening. So, so I would ask um, uh, Gifts, uh, if Nanyu Bukwe, if you can in one minute say a little bit about the, what you're doing with the community dialogue with the security around that. But Ogechi, I will come back also to you to talk about this model on rehabilitation circles, you know, the complete circle that uh, this uh, concept uh, also for one minute. And uh, if Choma is there, she will also talk about the family engagement. I'm told we don't have too much time, but if you can all do one one minute to give a little bit flavor on this. So the circle, the integrated rehabilitation package um, in, in terms of that has been piloted in the Southeast, then uh, if that's so gechi, then uh, if Nanya, you talk about the community dialogue and uh, Chioma can then talk about the issue of the family. Please, just briefly, one, one minute if you can. Okay. okay. Yeah, good afternoon, everybody. Um, sorry, I'm on the road. Right? Okay, so uh, for the community dialogue, uh, what we do basically is just to get... Your volume is not good. We're not hearing you well, please. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, better, better, yes. Okay. So what we do basically in the community engagement uh, activity is that we get law enforcement agents mentioned the police and members of the community, including traditional rulers and other law enforcement agents in that particular community, come discuss issues on community security partnership. So at this uh, dialogue, with more like a town hall. We discuss what are the challenges that the members of the societies are facing as regard to uh, policing and uh, security. Then they, okay. they allay the affairs and the law enforcement agents respond to some of these issues. And we create platforms where we can address some of the occurring issues. Just like uh, we had in a, a location in Abuja, where we began to train people on the issue of how to report gender-related violences in okay. their community. Okay, because of time, can we hear Katumi? Katumi on the Amajuris. Katumi, we have attention for the Amajuris. Katumi, please. And then yeah. after Katumi, yes. Can you have your video? Do you have, can we have you on your video, Katumi? Is it possible? Okay, I'm coming. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so after Katumi, we have uh, Choma and then round up with Ogechi if Choma is on ground. Choma on the family. Um, one, one minute each because of time. Yes, Katumi, go ahead. Good afternoon. The work we are doing with the Almighty Juries has to do with we are training them in the empowerment series where they have been trained on shoemaking. And so far, we've trained 35 Almighty Juries, the youth at Trix, and they were able to reproduce some shoes as a result of that training. And these shoes were sold out. And this about trying to give them a means of livelihood because it reduces a lot of issues that when they go out to fend for themselves, they get, in, um, they get um, a lot of um, problems with the um, communities. So we are trying to give them a means of livelihood and for them to be able to have something doing okay. for themselves. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Takatumi. I know that you're also working with a group of different Amajuris uh, co uh, component. So, uh, can if Chioma is there, okay. If not, okay. She can you talk about the rehabilitation circles, and then Chioma can talk about families if she's there, and then we we'll give back to okay. Lord quickly, the rehabilitation One circles minute. have to do with uh, holistic uh, rehabilitation, uh, reformation, rehabilitation, reintegration. So it's like it's uh, about starting off from the custodial center to give attention to inmates give them attention in terms of acquisition of skills, 
in terms of education, prepare them for outside, you know, when they will be released back into the society for acceptance. So the key thing about this is that it brings together all stakeholders. It brings together the correctional officers, the community, the families of these persons. And the beautiful thing about it is there's a lot of collaboration in this. All agencies or all organizations that work with custodial centers are brought together to address issues of these uh, inmates. But most interestingly, there's a component of mentorship and that is for returned citizens. These are leaders that left custodial centers that will be like shining examples for those inside. So you could have heard what Dr. Agomo said about some persons not being interested in any skills acquisition or the other. The mentorship component of this would enable this, those inside to learn lessons from those that have less, left who acquire skills while inside custodial mm -hmm. center and are doing well for themselves back in the community. And they equally okay. provide support to these persons. Why we equally have a team of these persons that have left and are doing well, a sort of support system for them so that they can support each other in, you know, uh, living better life in the society and avoiding recidivism. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, Rob, because I'm concerned about time, that's why we're stopping. But just know that this, that particular scheme that Ogechi just explained, we are piloting it in one of the geopolitical zones with five um, it's with five states and 15 custodial centers. And they, we tend to also scale it up uh, going forward. Um, because of time, I'm going to allow you, um, give, give it back to you. Um, yeah. Otherwise, there was somebody that was supposed to talk about families, but because of time, I'm giving it back. No, thank you very much. And, and it was great to hear all of those, that, that, that testimony, which was all connected. Um, everybody understands what the process is about. So that's a real, really great to, to find out so quickly and uh, uh, well. So thank you very much for your time today. Um, and what we'll do is we'll replay, we'll post the video up and we'll share that with you uh, so that you can watch it back and, and share it with people as well. But uh, okay. once again, thank you for your time and uh, we'll speak to you soon. Thank you. Thanks, thank you very much. And remember, it is a whole of society approach. Thank yes. you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye. You have been listening to the INCJ podcast, conversations about international criminal justice. To find out more, go to our website at criminaljusticenetwork.net or follow us on Twitter at INTCJ Network.